So welcome everybody to this uh, ADPC um, webinar series where we are starting out with the Asian Preparedness Partnership Learning Series. And uh, today uh, we will focus on uh, the leadership lens, fostering, inv inv sorry, fostering innovation for COVID-19 sensitive disaster risk reduction. And this is an online meeting, of course, to the, due to the circumstances. And uh, we'll be touching issues uh, relating to the new normal of how to engage in disaster risk reduction under the consequences of COVID-19. And what does it mean for us working in disaster risk reduction? And um, this particular session will focus on the leadership uh, parts, people who are uh, required to give direction uh, and take charge. And um, so the main objective of this webinar is to highlight and understand how local leaders and from different stakeholder groups have taken the lead in this COVID-19 situation and formulated innovative uh, solutions to taking disaster risk reduction and disaster risk management forward. Specifically, we are looking into to draw on insights from various leaders on fostering disaster risk reduction innovations in this time of COVID-19 pandemic and define strategies and lessons for managing future disasters in the region. And finally, also importantly, and I think this is a key issue on promoting shared lessons and exchange the ideas on, on, on this through this virtual dialogue. Um, before we um, start to get into all of the details, um, I would like to encourage all of you participants to use the Q&A box to put in your uh, questions. We will have some time to attend to some of the questions and we are also committed to later on uh, look into all of the questions that have been submitted and in a form uh, that will be uh, put forward later on, be able to provide feedbacks insofar as, as that's practicable because we may not be able to address all of the questions that may be put. Now, um, I would like to take the opportunity here to introduce our uh, panelists. And if I may start with uh, Dr. Valerie. Um, Valerie is a good friend of ADPC and uh, an important force, I would say, uh, and link between uh, disaster risk reduction and humanitarian response. Um, um, senior and dep deputy director in uh, Melinda, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been working together with us at ADPC for many years. Our second um, panelist is uh, Mr. Amrit, working for the government of Bihar in India. Uh, also a good friend who is always uh, very innovative and in coming up with good ideas in many areas. So I'm looking for, forward to his contribution to this webinar in terms of um, ideas and issues in response to how to work under these uh, COVID-19 uh, situations. Um, from Myanmar, our third panelist, uh, Mr. Tain, uh, Executive Director of the Capacity Building Initiative there and always coming with um, positive engagement with us and others. And uh, is of course a very central person in the civil society of, of Myanmar. Uh, moving on, we have Major General Sudanta uh, from Sri Lanka. Again, a central figure there, of course, in the Sri Lankan's disaster management and uh, a key person for ADPC to, and others to work with in uh, the areas of uh, response to disasters and uh, management of disaster risks. And finally, um, more engaged with perhaps the private sector perspective, uh, we have uh, Ms. Veronica from the Philippines, and uh, she will help us to be able to look into the perspective of where does and how does um, the more private and civil society as LinkedIn deal with these uh, changes. Um, with that, I would like to uh, move forward and uh, like to invite our first panelist. And I'm not really sure if you invite somebody to the floor in a webinar like this, but um, I would like to invite you, uh, Valerie, um, to um, perhaps elaborate on the issues of um, how do you see the changing role of leaders in this unprecedented time of uh, COVID-19? And if you could 
after that perhaps elaborate on examples of witnessing effective leadership in tackling the unprecedented uh, crisis situation. I will hand over uh, the floor in, in Seoul for you. Thank you. Thank you, Hans, um, and thank you to EDPC to organize that. I'm so grateful and I'm, I'm really kind of honored to have a, a so rich panelist with, with me and uh, from across the world. Um, I just wanted to say that it's almost humbling for me to be here in the middle of the US while we are talking about the COVID and but actually talking to the in Asia and this is a really good experience. I think to, to, to start, I just wanted to, to put in, in perspective the crisis we are living in. The first thing, if you look at COVID, it starts with the health crisis, but it become, it's more economic crisis, but it's actually a human crisis that we, we are having now. And when you look at that, we have to see it in a kind of a different perspective because it's not the normal disaster, it's not the normal humanitarian, it's not the normal um, crisis, uh, health crisis that we have seen. And, and the, the fact that the COVID is a pandemic, that is another perspective. That means that it's, I think, for the 100 years, the first time where most of the country in the earth are affected. That means that is each country have to make decision. And I think it enhanced the fact that as local leaders, as uh, leaders, each country, they, their acts will make a difference on how their people are coming. And I think this is making a big difference in this crisis in the way we need to think about the crisis because although it's a, it's a health, it's a human because individual um, behavior actually transfer are important for the community and the, 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 group, the group safety. And that is difficult. And one of the things that for me, um, I've put some element or some words that may look like uh, opposite or not opposite, but I think for me, this is what this crisis enables us to look at as a leader. First, it's a crisis that is global, but local as well. That means that as a leader, they have to see what is going on. It's a new for everybody, but we can, especially Africa and Asia, not the China was in the second wave. That means that there's a lot of things that was done in other countries that we can learn from in the global, what have they done and look at the best scenario, but none of the other country or other situation will be the same as yours. That means that although it's global and you learn from that global, you have to localize your solution. You have to, to be in the thing then global and local. That is the, the first thing. The second thing is that you need to be firm and empathetic because I think in a crisis like that, you have to make um, firm action you need to have leaders who can actually make clear action and firm action while they listen to people, while they are empathetic, while they understand that it's not just a health crisis. You cannot just say to people, just stay home and will be safe because if people don't eat, if people cannot have their livelihood, then you have to listen to that empathetic part and understand the society and what does that mean. The other word that will open is like open and decisive as a leaders you have to be open to listen to all the different pieces because it's a multi-sectorial multi-crisis but you need to be decisive because they were not a wrong or right they're all right solution but you have to do with the best that you have and that means bring me to the the next one you have to be having anticipation but you have to be creative and innovative because there's no way every day is changing and you have to to have that flexibility to be able to to look at it differently. And the more important, I think, is really the, the side that we are hopeful and we have to start looking at leaders who listen to their people, leaders who bring everybody at the table, but also make the decision. I think some of the few examples I will have, um, we, we saw the, the way, I will take one example, South Korea where they have a huge crisis at the beginning, they have a huge number of cases. Um, 
and suddenly the, they never really close and they never copy anybody because they decide that they have the, the quality, they have the, the technology, they have the knowledge, but also they have to, to evolve rapidly. And they create a trust with the community and that is important. The leaders there make decisions, they were transparency, that is important. That means that you can know what is it. There was data sharing, you can go in their website, you will see what is happening. They put the resources in place and they went rapidly. And actually, it's actually one of the best examples in the COVID now to, to look at the, when we look at this response. Um, and I think for me, that is another case. The other case is Singapore. That actually took similar action. But even when you have the flare, when you have the, the migrant who bring the other thing, they didn't just say shut them down and move everybody away or stop people coming. They actually treat them with respect while also stopping the outbreak to move. And I think these are some, and I'll take example like New Zealand, of course it's a complete, but they are free of COVID because they, their leader took action rapidly, anticipating. One of the things that we saw in Africa especially is that the case in Africa rapidly stopped because leaders there quickly closed all the airport, closed like before even is right there, and actually, that was an action that actually, but now they have to open it, but I think it stopped a little bit because it was a quick decision before even having cases some country, even I see Rwanda, before even having cases, they already shut down and they make the decision rapidly. They make the decision really in the, and they uh, um, move it really, they communicate really well with people and that helped the overall leaders. And this is one crisis where I think um, for long we have been looking at international to come and support the countries, but this is a crisis where each country is left on its own or leader have to make his decision. And we saw it thrive. We saw leaders thriving and resilient. And I think that is where I wanted to, to bring the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. And I mean, in short, um, I think it's important in your outline there of, uh, yes, it's a health crisis at essence, but that has economic consequences because of the shutdown, which then leads to human consequences and the human crisis. And bringing up this issue about perhaps more than ever, uh, leadership qualities that we have identified earlier, such as being open to listen and being able to balance different demands. But because of the time sequencing, you also need to make decisions and in many cases, perhaps with insufficient information, but those decisions need to be made. So to me, you have uh, basically emphasized that uh, normal lead leadership qualities remain, but perhaps they're putting a lot more stress on, yes, listen, etc. but don't wait until you have all of the information. Go ahead and make some decisions so you move forward. And you highlighted Korea's examples in Singapore. Uh, in the interest of moving forward, uh, Amrit, I would like to hand over to you. And uh, in this um, COVID-19 situation, it adds, as um, Valerie highlighted, the complexities in, in response. And of course, um, you are directly involved in the actual response um, to many different types of disasters. And what would you say, how do leaders adapt and act in these complex situations? And uh, what solutions would you recommend for leaders in similar um, situations to managing the cumulative impact of the crisis, as we're saying, it's not just the health part from it. The floor is yours. Very good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to see some familiar faces. Uh, it's, I think, after ages and more so after battling it out for 70 days. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Yesterday, I was very fortunate to be part of a webinar, a National Center for Good Governance, where we saw a very good presentation by Sri Lanka. And it's one of, uh, you know, a country which has done excellent job as far as containment of COVID is concerned. So I'm definitely looking forward to the speaker, a Major General Rana Singhe, His Excellency will uh, like to hear him. I'll just be very brief because I've been asked only to talk about, you know, in six minutes, I mean, you know, it's very difficult for a person 
who has been handling a crisis like this to tell him to sum up everything in five to six minutes. So point number one, when it comes to country at, at large, India, the kind of complexities, the kind of challenges which we have, and as you would have noticed, the Honorable Prime Minister perhaps was one of the first leader who reacted very swiftly. Because in India, we have our own challenges. It's not a question of a country at large with a kind of federal structure which we have. So the guidelines which were issued from the central government and to implement it at the provincial level, cutting across you know, the length and the breadth of the country in itself was a huge challenge. But how beautifully it was finally implemented can be gauged from the fact that notwithstanding the numbers now which are gradually moving up, we were able to contain this in a lot of our states like you know, Kerala, Goa, the smaller states. The examples which you are talking about, New Zealand, Korea, maybe Singapore, apart from the historical background, you must understand the population of these countries. Now, India being what India is, uh, some of the provinces have done very well. And perhaps one of the reasons is absolute coordination between a cooperative federalism, I think it has worked beautifully in this country. And even today, uh, yesterday for that matter, the Honorable Prime Minister was uh, talking to all the chief ministers through the video conferencing about the uh, medical infrastructure facilities. Coming to Bihar and my personal experience, um, having handled a lot of disasters, and in any disaster for that matter, uh, what are a couple of things uh, which happens in case of a flood or an earthquake? or any other localized disaster, people immediately look forward to the leadership. When it comes to the administrative functionaries, these people, they look up to their administrative bosses, the leaders, you know, they all want what is to be done next. Here was a pandemic uh, where, you know, we had by and large a very gloomy despair, fear of death, fear of uncertainty, recession in economy. Now, all these factors when I talk about, when you are concerned about your old age parents, you're concerned about your children. My son is still in US, he's stranded. I mean, till date, I mean, he's safe. I'm happy they're taking care of him, but he is stranded. He's, he's the only Indian who is there in, the, uh, in that place. Now, your near and dear ones, in this atmosphere, almost all the government servants are also impacted because they are all part of this, uh, you know, micro uh, system in which we work. So when we expect the people to respond, and as leaders, the administrative unit looks forward to the top leadership in the uh, bureaucracy or to the honorable chief minister, you must understand in a situation like pandemic, where you cannot physically move out, you have to ensure social distancing. You have to ensure evacuation of 3 million people back to your province. This is the largest evacuation operation undertaken in post-independent India in our province. And the logistics involved, it's, it's huge. And we must understand what we have done. This is against this uh, backdrop. Now, as a leader, uh, with the all humility at my command, some of the things which we did try, and I, I, I'm sure uh, this works you know, very well, is when you select your crack team for a mission like this, it's like a, a very specialized war where you have many generals, but people who, who you are dead sure who are sensitive, who are passionate, and more important what Dr. Valerie was telling, in a scenario like this, you must be a pro people. You must sympathize with those thousands and you know people, poor people who are stranded all over for no fault of theirs. It was nobody's fault. There are many things which we cannot answer even today. But the decision to enforce lockdown was in the larger interest. And as she was telling, it is not a question of a country alone. It's a it's an international issue, and we are all grappling, you know, with it. So the first decision we took was we picked on those people we knew could sustain this uh, real battle. And second, all these officers, you know, they believe in themselves. It's, 
uh, right at the beginning, you know, I'll tell you one thing. It's not what, the, uh, what others expect of you. What you expect of yourself is very critical. That should keep you moving, you know. And believe me, uh, 70 days, I, I really worked every day with my team and our spirit was, we were all excited. The excitement to face this challenge, there was never a moment in our office when we, we were gloomy because we tried our best to keep this atmosphere at a different plane. And for that, you know, you have to come out with a, a lot of new innovations. For instance, perhaps we are the only office now, we introduced this yoga. We made it mandatory for all our employees here in disaster management, it's a small department, but all our employees, including me, we had a one hour of yoga session in the evening. And believe me, that made a lot of difference because we used to work late night. And small things like our canteen, where we had things like oranges, bananas, lemon tea, just to motivate the employees, you know, just to tell them, guys, you are safe. Nothing to worry about it. We got this pre-medical checkup done for them so that they all are assured that, you know, they, they don't have to worry about it. These motivational songs and coming to our leadership, the administration, the cutting edge, our COVID warriors in the field, the district magistrates, we had people infected with COVID. Some of our district magistrates got it. Some of our senior superintendent of police, they got it. The local people. But managing these block quarantine camps of almost, uh, imagine, 3 million people, maintaining toilets for them, community kitchens for them, and ensuring social distancing. In camps, we ensured early morning yoga, physical exercises, entertainment. We had TVs installed for these poor people so that they could see at least some serials and this to get motivated. So if I have to sum up, if I have yes, to just please. Uh, all I can tell you is it was a it was a absolutely a great opportunity for me personally. Uh, we have learned a lot, but one thing I must say, the fear is still there. Mm -hmm. And you know what we have to work on is tell people that don't worry about it. And in Bihar, fortunately, thanks to the immunity level overall, the death, the number of death is is pretty low. So mm -hmm. what we have to tell them, just stick on to three basic things. Use sanitizers, use masks, physical distancing. There's nothing else to worry. We are limping back to normalcy, but we are taking a lot of precautions. And I'm sure the kind of experience all of us had and with the experience okay. sharing, which we are doing, definitely we will improve and we'll do much better in days to come. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, I will not summarize. I think you summarized it very well there at the end. Uh, instead, in the interest of time, I would like to move forward with uh, Mr. Ten and um, ask you to, um, as briefly as possible, as we have to be mindful of having some time with questions at the end, um, as the local uh, civil society partner in, in this group here, what challenges do you see in, in working together in this pandemic uh, situation? And, and what are some good practices that you think could be shared? The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, and good day to you all. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to share our experience in putting efforts to prevent and control the COVID-19. The challenges for us in working together in the pandemic situation are coordination among the partners as physical discussions and meetings are almost impossible. And the different levels of understanding by the people on the disease and how it could be protected and prevented. Most of all, trust among people was lost as well as they were over worried and became panicked because of the widespread of the news on the pandemic, some of which were true and some were false. The situation had made all of us shock to a position of no action. We all felt that we were far apart from each other and helpless. This was a general situation in our country at the early stage of the pandemic in March 2020. But our CSO leaders realized that we need to take action quickly and do as much as we could before the infection became uncontrollable. 
though all of us know that it is risky and dangerous. Through my experience, we quickly formed COVID-19 action group in the last week of February 2020. At this time, we were able to move freely. The action group was formed with the representatives of the members of the NMIU network and uh, immediately we met and discussed on what to do, how and where, by whom, for prevention and protection of the disease. As each of uh, us or each of the uh, member organizations belong to their respective community, uh, the quick reactions on awareness raising and education were designed and assigned among the group members and implemented in the community communities. To have thorough understanding of the disease, as well as how to protect from infection individually is key for preventing and controlling the disease. So the COVID-19 Action Group collectively mobilized funds among the members and disseminated the knowledge and understanding of the pandemic through distribution of IAC materials, awareness raisings by using loudspeakers and health speakers and requesting the people to follow the instructions by the Ministry of Health and supports, reminding them to stay at home, to wash hands frequently using soap and water or hand sanitizer and to put on masks whenever they go out. Again, the alcohol, hand sanitizer and masks disappeared on the shelf of the stores due to the panic buying of the people and this also made people over worried. Thus, the action group search for materials and methods how to produce liquid soap, hand sanitizers, and woven cloth masks. The group made short and informative videos on making these three things and distributed to the community leaders with memory sticks as well as through Facebook account. The group also produced a large amount of liquid soap and hand sanitizer and put them in bottles and distributed to the communities on free of charge. Besides, for washing hands after getting off from a public transportation or coming into or going out of a shop, water should be available. Thus, the action group innovated steel basins at the bus stops or on the roadsides where the connection of water from a source is available. At the same time, the COVID-19 action group realized the need for development of guidelines for community-based surveillance activity as well as guidelines for community-based facility quarantine and the group members and supporters work hard to complete the guidelines. A short video on discussion on stressed management for the people who were put up at the quarantine centers as people under investigation. After that, all of the documents and video were shared to the communities as well as to the authorities, such as Yangon Region Dev Department of Disaster Management and the uh, respect, respective minister of the Young Norwegian government as for the uh, helpful document. The activities of COVID-19 action group are effective and effic efficient by the good coordination with the regional government and the respective uh, departments. The lessons we learned are provision of necessary information about the disease to the public through any available communication channels and make up-to-date and correct information accessible is very effective in making the public prepared and protected. Another lesson is tracing the contact history of the infected person and put them under surveillance in quarantine centers and if possible test for virus is very effective in controlling the spread of the disease and this is all from us and thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And I think uh, just highlighting the point you mentioned first, this issue about losing trust and having to build, build that back and how that was seen as a priority early on, as well as this making sure that information comes out. Um, we move swiftly onwards here since we have a timetable to be able to have some questions and answers later. And Major General, um, I would like to invite you to the floor and um, to be able to perhaps look at from the national level here in Sri Lanka. How is Sri Lanka um, preparing the response agencies and uh, manage the relief and response activities coupled with the health concerns that obviously is 
um, making the issue more complex than under no pandemic situation. The floor is yours for the next six minutes. Thank you. Thank you, ADPC, and good morning to everyone. Uh, really, I was asked to concentrate more on the monsoon preparedness, but however, I'll touch upon the COVID as well. Uh, Sri Lanka is a very success story, I think, uh, as my Indian friend mentioned. It has been a success story for Sri Lanka because the executive leadership of Sri Lanka, together with the legislation and the judiciary, took the right decisions at the right time with and picked suitable professionals to mitigate this situation. As we all know, when COVID-19 was disturbing the whole world, the government of Sri Lanka was very fast to act. And on 26 January, the president instructed the Ministry of Health to appoint a National Action Committee to prevent the spread of deadly virus in Sri Lanka. And with the declaration of the pandemic by WHO on 11th March, Sri Lanka leadership immediately and the lockdown was. However, the health authorities, doctors, medical workers, together with the security forces and the disaster management center did not uh, rest and we were working 24 7 and uh, all these years. However, our stand was people first and taking people safety as priority. The lockdown came. I seem to have lost the sound and picture here. Yes, we seem to have uh, lost some of the connections here of the Major General and um, we perhaps in that case could uh, move forward to um, Veronica, um, and if um, Sudanta connects back in again, we can give the floor back after Veronica. So uh, please, Veronica, um, the private sector. And um, now, uh, how would you assess the preparedness of, of non-government and non-organized um, uh, in a formal sector or, uh, around the government issues and particularly of course the Philippine Disaster Resilience Foundation um, from dealing with the ongoing storm um, season and what what impacts does the COVID-19 have and, and particularly a, a couple of key lessons that you may be able to share with us all. Uh, with that I hand over the floor to you. Thank you, Hans. First, uh, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this uh, webinar. In response to that question, here in the Philippines, uh, where preparedness for natural hazards are in place, the challenge now is how to operationalize it with the presence of the COVID-19. And this is important for us because the Philippines gets an average of 20 tropical cyclones uh, in a year, and 50% the of them make or may cause damage. Not only that, we are also preparing for a 7.2 magnitude earthquake that can happen anytime in our national capital region, as well as the ongoing threat of a volcanic eruptions. And therefore responding to this will be greatly hampered in this time of the pandemic. And uh, this will be via the delivery of yes. a no, it's okay. and humanitarian aid due to limited mobility, logistics, access to affected communities, as well as ensuring the safety of our responders. And to help our network prepare for multiple disaster events, we develop risk communications materials to help them make informed decisions in preparation for other disasters while responding to and recovering from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in PDRF, we run an operations center where or which monitors uh, weather systems, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions and pandemics and provide alerts and updates to our network. Uh, we also conduct uh, tropical or tabletop exercises as part of our preparation. We also focus on business continuation, especially for the micro, small and medium enterprises. As you know, the MSME is a pillar in our program because they are, uh, the MSME is the backbone of our Philippine economy. 
And as early as March, we already conducted surveys among them to check and monitor their status. And then we proceeded to conducting several webinars, develop tools and activities to reach out to them and bring together experts and the neighbors from the government to help them make their businesses recover and responsive to the new normal. All of these are featured in our online platform we call CCAP, which is a one-stop shop opportunity platform for MSME business recovery in partnership with Connecting Business Initiative, UN OCHA, and UNDP. So overall, preparedness and resilience are really key factors that will determine our survival and the ability to adapt and thrive in the next normal. Over to you, Hans. Thank you for that very concise and uh, I think highlighting the point of saying that, yes, there's a lot of preparedness and other things, perhaps similar to other years, but with an extra effort of the assessment that you were talking about and ensuring that reaching out with information and then, of course, your online resource, which is um, uh, an important tool in this context. Um, I see, Major General, um, you have uh, returned. And um, I would like to uh, take the opportunity here to give back the floor to you so you can continue um, where you were uh, presenting. And um, we will look forward to your um, experiences and, and recommendations. So I'll hand over the floor to you for a um, continuation of your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, sorry for the technical uh, little mistake. And However, coming back to the subject again, so uh, as I mentioned, the leadership of Sri Lanka took full control and uh, COVID uh, never went into the community in Sri Lanka. And uh, really the success story was uh, tracing and finding people, employment of national intelligence services, locking down, timely locking down, and provision of free medical care, then door-to-door -door supplies, door-to-door uh, -door, uh, health and food deliveries, then free quarantine, and uh, uh, free COVID testing, soft testing, everything was done. And uh, as at today, our total is only 1,946, out of which 1,421 is recovered and only 11 deaths and we never went to the community it had been always in clusters and uh, all our students in overseas countries were brought back to sri lanka and uh, all our employees who are in different different countries i mean 50 percent have come back and others are also in the process of coming back so uh, country has come back to normal we are again working and uh, then the second issue came up to disaster management center for us that is uh, planning and preparation for uh, next issue of Southwestern monsoon. Now, planning and preparation for the monsoon connected with COVID, then dengue, then leptospherosis, uh, commonly known as rat fever, all came together. And we, as we all know, Ampan cyclone came in. And with the Ampan cyclone, we had kind of a rehearsal and initial uh, dry run uh, to cater for disaster mitigation of uh, uh, all these issues where we have been expecting worst case scenario in this year. Uh, however, we had our technical agencies working together with us from the beginning. From March, we started planning and preparation together with COVID and then planning for this. So the technical agencies was mainly the security forces, the health authorities. Then we have the medical and the med department, we are national building research organization, that we are national disaster relief center, the irrigation department, the media played a vital role. With that, when we had the Asian preparedness partnership on the ADPC, thank you, and World Food Program, Asia Pacific Alliance for Disasters, UNDP, World Vision, Chamber of Commerce and the SLPP and Red Cross, etc. All these people came in together as a team and uh, even with lockdown and quarantine, we had continuous uh, discussions, communications, and we worked together, did planning and preparation, and we conducted a number of media briefings. And then uh, we had a uh, number of uh, appearances in social media and educating people. So coming down to field functions and field activities, what we did. 
uh, disaster management committees were reactivated and disaster management center officials visited all vulnerable districts. We had about six to seven vulnerable districts. And we conducted preparatory discussion with district disaster management committees uh, for the mitigation of monsoon landslides together with COVID, dengue, and the rat fever. So identification of centers were done well in advance. Uh, keeping the health and safety guidelines with adequate health facilities, screening process, then including registration and uh, other preliminary arrangements. However, special emphasis was vested on safety of women, children, elders, and differently able people. However, everyone was informed of what, when, where, and how, what they are supposed to do. Technical and public early warning systems were established with electronic and social media, as well as leaflets. Posters, handbills, and small booklets were distributed to all relevant areas, and persons giving all vital information, as well as do's and don'ts under medical protocols. Then safety center administrative instructions were issued describing all medical protocols, and plans were developed for uh, continuation of essential services such as ambulances, electricity, drinking water, waste management, including disposal, disposal of sanitary and surgical waste with relevant authorities. All the ministries together with us, we have been working around the clock then. However, forward positioning of SAR teams, search and rescue teams with equipment and gear was planned and executed. And forward positioning of dry rations were arranged, including plans for hot meals and cooking centers with medical supervisions were carried out. Quarantine centers and medical aids and reps were earmarked at all high risk areas. And new systems of a new system what we brought in was friends and relatives. Uh, this was introduced to limit the number of people coming into quarantine centers. So they were proposed go to friends and relatives, however, dry food, whatever the allowances, whatever they are due. Uh, were guaranteed to wherever they are. Again, we were we advised people to inventorize all their valuables, whatever the belongings in their in what they have in those houses for subsequent insurance purposes. Uh, over and about that, economic stimulus packages for business was provided very early by the government, like task force for economic revival and poverty alleviation was established where DMC and I was a member of that. Then we have the task force for delivery, delivery of essential services were established. Again, DMC was partners. Then we had oh, debt uh, moratorium. Yeah. Major uh, General, thank you very much. May I? Okay. Uh, I, I apologize to cut you short, but we want to have some uh, discussions about question and answers that have been put forward. It's obviously, um, as in summary, it's a very detailed and systematic approach that have made a, a great success here in this context. And I think there's much to learn from many other details that you actually were tending to. Um, with that, uh, I would like to uh, move into a um, question and answer session here. We have received a number of um, questions and uh, we will not be able to entertain all of them. And we have uh, still time to um, keep track on uh, in this context. I must say um, this particular issue is a little bit new to me in the sense that uh, we're doing this online and we get a way of uh, managing it. But um, I will pick one question here first for uh, Valerie. And I um, would like to, if you can keep it very short in your response, um, then I think we can move forward uh, to other ones. Um, the question uh, put forward here is, um, how can you implement the innovative ideas, etc., that you were putting forward with existing regulatory arrangements, and particularly concerning the existing local government regulations, etc., when you want to do new things. So, the floor is yours. Yeah, and that is the, the that is a really good question because the the regulatory, and that is why we're talking about preparedness. A lot of these things should be and could be done before any disaster, and I think we're learning a lot about that. The, that is the first question. The preparedness is essential. But also, I think one of the positive things or silver lining of any crisis is that it pushed the system beyond and it forced the system to change. And actually, I see it more as an opportunity to push, and that is where the people and the, the have the capacity to push their legislation 
at this moment to make that change. We are um, muted. Yes, yeah. yes. This is all going back and forth. So uh, thank you very much and for your concise uh, reply there. Um, we will move forward and I would direct the next one to Mr. Ten. Um, I think uh, the question here is, what do you think is the value addition of local civil society organization uh, in this or during this pandemic? The floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Um, the civil societies as well as the civil uh, society organizations, uh, they are taking part in all of the uh, movement of the fighting against the COVID in the uh, country. And so uh, in, in any form of the, uh, the participation uh, by the civil society, uh, I think it is really very important uh, because in our country, quite a number of uh, quarantine centers, uh, both uh, facility quarantine and community uh, quarantine centers, and the the civil societies are taking part in the quarantine centers and the role of civil society uh, is key, I think, to uh, maintain and to uh, operate the quarantine centers effectively and efficiently. Uh, the health uh, staff, the Ministry of Health staff, they are mainly responsible for the health uh, uh, care, but for the running of the quarantine center, and operating the center is uh, in the hands of the, the volunteers as well as the uh, community level uh, uh, committees uh, that is the, played by the mostly the civil society and the members of some members of the civil society organizations. So I think uh, to my understanding that uh, we cannot separate the people, the citizen and the civil society because people are the uh, the civil society in the society, and they are fighting against together uh, to the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So it is really very okay. uh, important. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that elaboration. I will uh, move forward onwards, and uh, there is a question for you, Amrit. And um, the question is really on how is the welfare of communities being taken care of and what are the challenges you are facing in this particular area? Amrit. Yeah, like as I mentioned, you know, after we evacuated uh, 3 million people, the, one of the biggest challenge uh, is to provide employment to these people. Uh, the local government has absolutely no issues and already the reverse migration has started with things easing up. But all those people, who have decided to stay back here for a while. What we have done is we have set up these district counseling centers in every district. And thanks to our COVID portal, we, we have this entire database with us, people who have come back to Bihar and the, the kind of skill in which you know, they have specialized. So we are doing the skill mapping and we have identified six sectors where we are providing the employment to these local people and the work is going on, for instance, I look even after the electricity sector. So we have uh, employed uh, as many as 500 people already, and they are working with us. So yes, uh, providing employment to these people is our first challenge. And second, and very important, with the kind of density of population, which is the highest in India, we are going for a large scale sensitization uh, of the masses, telling them about the use of masks, the, the real importance of physical distancing, how you have to be there, especially when it comes to the marketplaces. And now that we are almost on the verge of facing floods, which is an annual feature here, our challenges are there to really make effective and new SOP in the light of this COVID pandemic and how we are going to enforce it. Little bit of it has been facilitated by the use of the block quarantine camps. But yes, the last challenge we are geared up is to face the floods. Okay, thank you very much. Um, moving on, I have a question for you, Veronica. And um, what are the practical measures that are needed to support local 
small and medium size uh, enterprise. I think even micro, small, medium enterprise, so just, uh, especially with in the informal economy. Yes, they are. As uh, with, with this, what happened with the COVID-19, our micro entrepreneurs are really the most vulnerable uh, in this situation right now. And as I have mentioned, uh, that is the very reason why we focused uh, on uh, providing them with tools and, and um, uh, activities that uh, will be able to provide them with uh, the much needed information. At this point, communication is key. Information information would be a, a, a lifesaver for them at this point. And so uh, people are very hungry for information. Um, for the past few months, they've been hungry about knowing about the pandemic, about this coronavirus or the COVID-19. And at this point, I think they have enough knowledge um, and understanding of uh, how to cope up with it. But right now, the question now is how will they thrive in this, um, in this situation? Uh, the situation is dire. Uh, businesses cannot uh, or are not yet fully recovered. And yet they have employees that they have to take care of. Employees have to take care of their families. So that's the dire situation right now that our small enterprises are, are, are facing. Uh, the good thing is that uh, the government um, is providing them with stimulus packages um, and uh, other assistance are provided. But then again, uh, the issue right now is where to get the right information. A, a lot of fake news is, is uh, in the social media. So how, how do we make sure that they get the right information? Mm -hmm. And that is why uh, we came up with this uh, one-stop shop platform to help them. So in that, in that platform, all the necessary information, where to get loan, mm -hmm. what kind of assistance they can get, uh, not only from the government, but also uh, among the private, uh, within the private entities, um, insurances, that they can provide that or they, they mm. can get those information in one place. So that's one. And then second is uh, we also, because, you know, Philippines is composed of uh, so many islands, yes. and, uh, we focus on tourism. So uh, in the case of tourism, we go from one uh, island to the next uh, in partnership with USAID, and uh, we focus on their uh, a specific uh, industry. And then we bring enablers from the government, uh, from, from the bigger entities, from the, the bigger companies to provide them with ideas, best okay. practices okay. that they can get inspiration from. So, uh, and, and lastly, the thing is, as we, Go, go through all these um, activities. Hope, okay. as Dr. Valerie said, it is important that we communicate hope to inspire them that uh, working together, we can actually overcome yes. this COVID-19 and we will be much, much better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, I have one last question here for um, Major General Sedanta. Um, the is there any mechanism to document community responses and satisfaction levels to improve your response in the relation of what you explain or that very detailed down to local level? Um, keep your uh, response brief if you can, so we have a little bit of a wrap up after this. Uh, I understand uh, if, I'm, if I understood your question correctly, are you asking about the documenting or the lessons learned or how to Ex exactly. how do we get information from the uh, ground of course yes because we have very uh, good uh, public administrative system in sri lanka which goes down to the lowest village level then uh, reporting again bottom up system and we have uh, uh, task forces with a uh, uh, number of econ economic uh, stimuluses awarded for the people and uh, there are uh, call centers reporting mechanisms reporting centers all that is done of course uh, some universities have already started on uh, mm -hmm. case studies and getting information back. And as I said, now uh, we, I have one proposal on my table. Again, we are going to activate and join up with these universities. And I'm sure other uh, public and private agencies also will join up with us. So we are in the process of collecting these things. And of course, DMC will be the uh, 
uh, most important data center. So we will have all this information and we'll provide it to, to all the authorities, even our uh, friendly members, uh, partners with all these people and government is working on that. Well, thank you very much. And, and thank you all for um, responding there. As I mentioned before, we have collected uh, the questions and uh, later on you will um, find a website where we will have um, follow up and try to make sure that there is responses to all of that. Uh, we are running out of time here and we're coming into the second to last session here. I will ask you all for a key message and I will want you to keep within the time of less than 60 seconds. So nothing elaborate here. We just want to get some capture issues of some key measures and or some key messages uh, as we move forward uh, in this work. And um, Valerie, I'll begin with you. The clock is counting. <laughs> um, thank you. I think for me it's like the, the, the hope, but more important leaders have to put their people at the center of the, their response and putting them at the center and having them provide a solution themselves. And it's together that we can make it. Thank you. That was very quick. Uh, Amrit, a key message or key message. I think we need to unmute Mr. Amrit somehow. Yeah. Uh I would just uh, like to be very brief. It's to infuse, to infuse a sense of hope amongst the people at large. Be positive, and as far as the administration is concerned, teamwork makes dream work. Thank you. Okay, I think we can start putting all of these slogans together <laughs> in a list later on. Thank you very much, Amrit. Um, moving forward, there, Mr. Tain. What would you uh, sum it up in, in some, a key message? All right. Um, I think uh, my message is that uh, do not worry too much. At the same time, do not uh, ignore or neglect uh, because we should be very careful all the time, uh, but not over worried. And follow the guidelines. I think the guidelines are very easy. Wash your hands to put on a mask and to avoid the, the crowd, <laughs> so uh, social distancing. I think this is the key message for me. Thank you very much. And uh, Major General Sudanta, what would your key message be in very short term? Yeah, it's uh, really the leadership and fast decision making and prompt action, economical uh, revival. And finally, it's most important is the uh, discipline of people adhering to medical protocols and health advisors because it's not over till we find vaccination we have to be very careful if you neglect yourself you are neglecting your village town and you are neglecting your whole country so everybody must be aware of and be disciplined thank you for that and uh, moving swiftly forwards veronica you are not you ended up always last but in this case i mean you have the last word so i mean that is a compensatory issue. Please, what would you put forward as your key message? It will have to be coordination and collaboration because we can, you know, we can talk of strategies all day, but eventually uh, coordinating and collaborating will make all these strategies work. And it has to be multi-sectoral approach. And that is why uh, for PDRF, it is important that we work through field prep of the APP, where we can ensure that different stakeholders can work together in strengthening the capacity of local stakeholders. So better coordination in preparedness and response, considering that the Philippines is one of the world's most disaster affected countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I, I don't really know how you do in a webinar when you normally ask for a, a round of applause for all our panelists, but I suppose it's a, a virtual one of, of this. Thank you so much for your insights and your uh, information. I will ask the technical staff here to perhaps put up a, a backdrop here with the uh, website address for where you in the near future will be able to find uh, not only a recording of this uh, webinar, but also we will provide uh, feedback on comments and, and questions and answers, etc. for those many questions that came in uh, that uh, we could not entertain. I would like to make a special thanks to all of the 
staff in my, organi my organization here who has managed to make this uh, smooth. This is the first time actually I'm really trying to manage uh, a, a webinar of these sorts and I, I am very appreciative for how smooth that made. And of course, for all of you who um, were uh, clocking in, so to say, and, and, um, and were part of this uh, webinar, um, we are uh, going to move forward and have additional webinars. So keep this uh, website uh, in mind and, and look it up. And I'm sure if you find uh, interesting topics, we will move forward. Uh, I would like to extend my thanks again to the panelists and I hope that in the not too distant future we may meet physically and uh, in the meantime I hope we will have the opportunity to meet uh, I don't like the word virtual and work online. Virtual has a connotation of not being real but I think this is very real. So um, thank you very much and I think um, with that, not knowing again exactly how you end <laughs> a thing like this, uh, um, again, uh, thank you all. And um, I wish to um, be in contact with you shortly again. Thank you very much.